All right, guys, we'd like to get started with the uh, next portion of our program. If everyone could be seated. Welcome back from break. Um, our next speaker, uh, Dr. David Miramontes, started his medical and EMS uh, experiences as a high schooler uh, as a volunteer firefighter EMT in Northern California. Uh, he attended medical school at the University of Toledo Medical School. It used to be Ohio <laughs> Medical School. And completed his EM residency at Mercy St. Vincent's Medical Center uh, in the area. After his residency program, uh, David remained in Northwest Ohio working at uh, Mercy St. Vincent's as an emergency medicine residency core faculty member and served as the ED medical director for three years at Mercy St. Charles Hospital. Uh, he was the EMS medical director of numerous fire departments in Northwest Ohio, including the City of Toledo Fire Department and Lifestar Ambulance. Uh, Dr. Miramontes assumed a command position in August 2011 as an assistant chief of fire and EMS and medical director for the District of Columbia, Columbia Fire and EMS Department in DC, where he served for three years. He is nationally registered as an EMT, a hazmat tech, as well as Firefighter II qualified, and has been deployed many times over the last 20 years with the US Department of Health and Human Services in the National Disaster Medical System. MDMS. Currently, he practices EMS medicine full-time as a medical director for the City of San Antonio Fire Department. The department has over 1,700 firefighter EMTs and paramedics serving to protect the seventh largest city in the U.S. Please join me now in welcoming Dr. David Miramontes. All right, thank you. Good morning. All right, so in Texas, so I'm now, they let me into the Republic of Texas. So in Texas, when we, we don't say good morning, we say howdy. And the audience says, howdy. there we go. OK, good. So good morning. So if you fall asleep in my lecture, you become part of my lecture. Fair warning. OK? If you doze, you get to be part of my lecture. So stay awake, stay engaged, and we'll rock and roll. So today, I'm going to talk to you about a couple things, some of the stuff that we're doing in San Antonio. So just all that stuff he says, a bunch of baloney. I'm a knuckle dragon ER doc that uh, does EMS full time. I'm a pre-hospitalist, my full time job is EMS. I'd rather be in the back of an ambulance than in an office or a hospital any day of the week, okay? I love starting IVs, giving bloods, and seeing patients out in the field environment. I do house calls. I'm the only, I say I'm the, um, when I, I joke around with the, my public officials, I say, I'm the busiest damn doctor in San Antonio. And they go, well, what do you mean? I say. Well, I see 160,000 patients a year with my paramedics and myself. How many do you see, Doc? He said, uh, 12. Okay. So anyway, so I have, uh, am blessed. I have no conflicts of interest. I work for the state of Texas, so I can't get paid by anybody. And so I don't have any conflicts of interest, so that's good. Um, so no one owns me. Today, I'm going to talk to you about a little bit about change. So EMS is a changing. And if you think back of when I was an EMT uh, in high school and what, what that was all about, my fire captain told me, boy, see that CPR case right here? I want you to put that demand valve on the patient and you blow it up till that thing starts going ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da ba da ba da ba da ba da ba da and then you know you got enough air in the patient. Okay, Cap. And then what happened after that? The vomit volcano occurred, right? Exactly. So things are changing. And even the practice since I was here in Ohio has changed. Our scope of practice is changing what we're doing, our, uh, the way we take care of patients, the way we interact with patients, we have to get on board. So we can't get stuck in a rut in that old orange book, EMT uh, book that I had back when I was 17. So where are we going? So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about three big buckets in a second. This is something, and oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, you get homework. Yeah, so start writing stuff down. Okay, so EMS Agenda 2050, this just came out. You should read this. It's kind of like a sci-fi novel because it says oh, there's these little vignettes of what EMS might be like in the future. And to be honest with you, a lot of these little vignettes may seem a little weird at first, but when you start thinking about the power of what's in your iPhone and what you can do with that, a lot of it is not all that unusual. So I really want you to look this up, EMS agenda. You can Google it and take a look at it sometime in the next couple days before you go home, uh, before beer, please, and uh, get an idea of what's going to happen. This is very well thought out. It's kind of our roadmap for what's going to happen in the future. The other thing that I need to talk to you about what's going to happen in the future is the three big buckets, and that's what my lecture is going to be about today, the big three. 
One, you got to practice evidence-based medicine. You have to grow your practice of medicine as we learn more. We used to do stupid stuff back in the day, and now we know that some of that stupid stuff is what used to kill our patients or it wouldn't allow them to be alive. So now we have to practice edge, cutting edge basic medicines. We're going to talk about a little bit about that. And I'm going to give you some examples of some of the stuff, the cool stuff we're doing in San Antonio. We have to be navigators for change in our community. EMS has to be a community-based service. We have um, you know, community police officers. We have the fire prevention process that we did in the fire service was hugely successful in decreasing the number of fires, right? So my fire department is the seventh, we serve the seventh largest city in the United States. It is a great EMS system that does fire very well. Did you hear what I said? I work for the San Antonio Fire Department. We are a great EMS system that does fire very well because our fire calls are a small portion of what we do anymore. It's all 83% EMS uh, calls and site. So we have to change our perspective and what the job is now is different what the job it was then. But we have to be part of our community and be leveraged to change. The third bucket is wellness. I'm gonna talk about community wellness and your, um, your institutional wellness and your personal wellness in a minute, okay? Because that is a big deal because we can't help others if we haven't helped ourselves to be as healthy as we can so that we can do our jobs uh, and be happy and healthy and successful in our lives. So those are the three big buckets we're gonna talk about this morning. Practice evidence-based medicine, this is the first one. So that means you might actually have to read something uh, besides cartoons or stuff on YouTube, okay? What I found in my organization is that my paramedics don't read memos. My paramedics don't read email. I have to make videos that they can watch on their phone, okay? If it's not on their phone, it doesn't exist in reality, right? So I have to have an app for that. So I have a cog, I have an app from all our protocols. I have an app for hand heavy to calculate math because we don't want them doing math anymore because you know new math doesn't work in medicine, right? And we have to do videos on stuff like, hey guys, I want you to do CPR this way. And we have to show them a video, okay? So that's some of the changes we have to do. But when we do these changes, we have to do it effectively. We look at the clinical expertise of the process, that we look at the best evidence, and we look at the patient's uh, needs and values. And we have to figure out what can we pull off with our budget, with our training time, right? We still have to train for fires and tech rescue and floods and swift water and hazmat and all that kind of stuff. So I can't do everything EMS in my fire department, but we have to build that in. So when you bring in change to your organization, you have to also bring, have an idea of how you're gonna pull that off. And you might have to do it slower than you'd want to, okay? That's another struggle that I have. I want everything like yesterday, right? But we can't do it all at once. You probably should get to know a couple other websites. You should probably know about the National Model for EMS Guidelines. So this is the NISEMSO, the National Association of State EMS Officials. They actually have a national model uh, of evidence-based guidelines. Um, those links are, are live. If you get my lecture from the download or whatever, those links are live, you can just click it. But look at the clinical model. This tells you some, some pretty smart people in the room, that's not me, um, smart people in the room figure it out, you know, what's the best way of taking care of an asthma patient, for example, or um, how to do cardiac arrest. And so there's some really good things. This, so if you've got an old set of, of protocols that your medical director um, hasn't dusted off in a while, you might say, hey doc, what do you think about this? You know, so in my organization, we used to have chiefs meetings when I was up here in Ohio. And I actually had one last, uh, last week with some of my old chiefs just to get together and uh, swap stories and tell lies, you know. So during those chiefs meetings, which usually involve some form of alcohol, um, we actually discussed a lot of uh, these types of things, like what's uh, up and coming with uh, 12 lead EKG, for example. So one of my most uh, progressive EMS agencies when I was in Ohio was in fact a volunteer part-time uh, paid department. And they were the most cutting edge, up to date, because they came to drill every Wednesday. They were a captive audience. They didn't have salary, so they put all their um, you know, pancake breakfast money and all that stuff into equipment. They had some of the shiniest, best ambulances and the shiniest, best equipment. And we were able to do some of this cutting edge stuff with these small organizations. And then guess what happened after that? Well, if Rossford can do it, how come they can't do it? I, I, if they can do it, why can't we do that? And it just blossomed throughout our organizations. And that change was infectious, just like a, a wildfire in California. 
So look at the national guidelines, get an idea of are our protocols up to snuff? Do we need to kind of tweak them a little bit? What kind of education? What's new? What can we add into our programs? And do that on drill nights if you're a volunteer or part paid patient, uh, company. Look at the National Association of EMS Physicians. All this stuff's free, it's online. There are policy statements. Like for example, if you are still doing a collar and backboard on everybody for trauma patients, uh, you ought to probably look at the policy statement for selective C-spine immobilization because we don't do that anymore, right? And there's a lot of good data that you can use and a good paper that is co-written by the EMS experts, the surgeons, you know, those surgery dudes, and um, the National Association EMTs. So there's some good documents on there to help, you know, make your play when you want to make a change and say, hey, look, this is what we're doing across and other places in the nation. Here's the policy statement from NMSP. We probably shouldn't put everybody on a backboard, for example. So these are all resources for you to help. Let me give you another example, CPR. I remember I told you the story about when I was a teenager and the captain said, hey, just blow it up till the guy basically pops with air because green gas is good in CPR. Well, now we know that's stupid, right? Because we're putting all that positive pressure in the chest. We were overventilating the patient and they were getting like zero blood flow. There was no blood going in and out of that heart. So now we need to change the way that we do CPR. So here's some a preview of coming attractions. And I think Dr. Pepe is doing a lecture on this later on today. Um, so if you want to get up to date on CPR, talk to the uh, Mr. Pepe man because he'll give you the up to date scoop. Bystander CPR. Believe it or not, that's probably the most important thing. Not the shiny ambulance with the fancy paramedic. It's, by, it's something very much less sexy, and that's bystander CPR. So that means in your community, you got to get involved with CPR in the schools. Faith-based education. Think about it. You're in mosque, church, or temple at least once or twice a week. Hello, captive audience, giddy up. Train them how to do CPR, how to use the AED, how to do stop the bleed. I have medical students doing that for their senior project. You have all these uh, high school kids that need senior projects. Get them out teaching. That is what's important. And that is cheap and easy. All it takes is a little time. You can use duty crews. You can use volunteers. You can use kids. I don't care. Get out and teach. Okay? Get your community involved. Dispatch CPR. Now, this is a little tougher nut to crack because most dispatch agencies are sheriffs, right? Sheriff's offices. So you got to get in with their mojo and try and invent uh, the fact that we should be doing CPR education. But it's really not as complicated as you'd think it is. It's really simple. They're not conscious, not interacting, not breathing normally. Are they breathing normally? That's important because agonal respirations, you can still breathe even though you need CPR. They're not breathing normally. Go do CPR. No, no, go. Are you going to start CPR on a drunk or a drug overdose and they wake up? Sure you are. Great. You did noxious stimulus. Now they're waking and breathing, probably puking a little bit too, but that's fine. So no, no, go. Something you can simply do even with a sheriff's office dispatcher or a layman. You don't have to have all this fancy education and accreditation and all of that kind of stuff. Use non-traditional responders. Here in Ohio, I used to, there was a little town in Bryan where on Mondays was garbage day. So guess what they did? They put the jump bag and the AED in the garbage trucks. They were already part of the fire department. They already had a pager. They're already out on the streets, and they were closest responders. Hello. What's, what's more important, them driving back to the station to get the shiny ambulance or get on scene where they have the AED and their jump bag, and they start doing CPR until the rest of the volunteers can get there? B, think out of the box. Use your park rangers, your lifeguards. Use your non-traditional um, responders, such as security guards. Use people in your organization, road crews, uh, the guys that do um, the pick up trash, whoever. You engage your non-traditional responders. Use the AED early and have them around. Put them in vehicles where it counts, right? So it doesn't make sense to have an AED on a fire truck if the fire truck ain't going to get there in 8 to 10 minutes. Put it in the cop car instead because the cops go in there anyway, right? So try and engage your first responders. So rescue CPR, so those old people, so I, I remember, no financial ties or whatever. Those old folks are outside, and we're embracing rescue CPR. Rescue CPR is the active compression and active decompression. Ladies and gentlemen, CPR is all about the suck. Did you hear that? CPR is all about the suck. 
and the suck is the upstroke. It's the recoil phase. If you can pull up with the rescue CPR device or with the Lucas device that has limited uh, recoil, you're going to improve uh, venous return, you're going to suck blood from the brain, and you're going to start forward circulation, decreasing intracranial pressure, and you're going to have a brain that's actually being perfused. I'm going to tell you we have people that we have to sedate during CPR in my organization. We have to put them down with ketamine because they're awake with Lucas CPR. They're trying to grab the endotracheal tube. Now, if you turn off the Lucas, they go, and they're dead. But during uh, rescue CPR, they wake up because their brains are being perfused during CPR. My medics can have a pulse ox of 92%, a CO2 of 35, and the patient's in a systole. They have physiologic parameters with good, high-quality CPR. And the ITD and the pump are probably the way to do it. Do great ELS but no, de really decrease the number of doses of epi or the dose. In fact, in my organization, if you can feel ephemeral pulse with Lucas, you don't give any epi. Zero. <laughs> None. Because all that does is screw with the brain. It vasoconstricts the brain, and then you get no blood flow to the brain. So we don't give epi. We don't even teach ACLS anymore in our organization because we know that the principles that are taught there are actually counterintuitive to the way we're doing CPR in our organization. So less epi. Transport to resuscitation center. You could have the best chain of survival in the world, bystander CPR, telephone CPR by dispatcher, barking at the people to get on the chest, no, no, go. You have garbage guys that ride with the AED and start blasting away, and you have your first responders uh, show up and your medics show up. But if they get to the hospital and they don't do the bundle of care, which includes going to the cath lab, hypothermia, and keeping them alive for 7 to 14 days before they bump them off, you're not going to get people walking out of the hospital. So you have to do the whole bundle of care. And that's what we're, we're talking about this morning. Cath lab and hypothermia, my hospitals have to sign on the line that say, if you want your pa my patients, you have to agree to A, take them to the cath lab within two hours, regardless of their rhythm, and immediately if they have a STEMI, and you have to put them down with 33 to 34 degrees Celsius for one to two days. And if you don't sign on the line, I'm not bringing you patients to your hospital. Thanks. Well, we'll go up the street. Okay? So you have to be bold, and you have to demand what's best for your patients and push that uh, cutting-edge EMS medicine right through the hospital doors, as we've done with IOs and CPAP and all the other things that we've innovated as an EMS organization. And rehab for cardiac arrest starts on day one because we have to assume the patient's gonna walk out of the hospital and we have to do everything we can to make sure that patient's ready to go home. So we start rehab on day one, even though they're unconscious, even though they're on the vent, even though they're sedated, and even though they're at 33 degrees, we do everything we can to prevent foot drop and decubitus ulcers and peptic ulcer uh, disease and DVT and all that stuff. We start rehab on day one. And if you're not committed to doing that, I'm not bringing my patients to you. That's how it works in Texas. And don't give up. Don't turn off the vent unless you have a reason to do so. So unless their brain is trashed on day two and it's degrading because of um, hypoxia, wait it out. We have people that wake up on day 13 or 14 and ask for a sandwich, and they were Vegematics previous. So you have to wait it out. The brain takes time to heal, and you have to give them time in order to uh, show themselves. We use the Take Heart America bundle approach because it's a bundle of care, that, in, and I want you to look this up when you go home, Take Heart America. It's a different approach to cardiac arrest care where the focus is the bundle of care for everyone working together to get that patient home, and it includes survivor support after they go home. All right, let's talk about some other cutting edge stuff, the bleeding patient. So we don't use ABCs. That's what you're taught, right? We have adopted the MARCHES protocol. We've been doing this three years now in San Antonio, and we're saving lives. The first thing you have to do is stop massive bleeding. We used to say airway. Well, that's great. You have the patient intubated, and you're ventilating them, but they just bled all their blood volume on the floor in the last four minutes while you're dicking around with that. Not a good plan, okay? You have to stop massive bleeding as your first action. That includes tourniquets, packing, wound care, pressure dressings, whatever you have to do. Put your finger in the hole and push the vessel against the bone. Open the hole so you can get your finger in the hole if you have to in a junctional wound. You have to take care of massive bleeding as your first priority or you will have a dead patient, which you cannot do airway breathing circulation on later. 
Then you do an aggressive airway management. You can use simple stuff like a nasal pharyngeal airway, the rubber nose that goes in the hose, my favorite airway. One step suctioning, you put the catheter on the end of the nose, slurp, you've just cleared the airway in one step. It's a great way to do um, rescue task force training because the airway stays in place and they won't gag on it. If you have to do a, well, I mean, Ohio, I'm saying the crike is not a big deal, but in my place, it's a big deal. If you've got a gunshot wound to the face and you can't if intubate or ventilate, you criculate. Intubate, ventilate, criculate. It's one of those three. I don't care. So there's got to have air going in and out. So we actually train our medics to do surgical crikes. And we use the bougie method, and we train them on cadavers, and they're really good at it. And they don't flinch. You don't have to call for orders. You just do it. If you can't intubate or ventilate, you criculate. It's that simple. We push uh, tourniquet use. We push that heavily. We try to push wound packing. We teach all our EMTs how to pack wounds with Celox or combat gauze. We use pelvic binders, and we give whole blood. I didn't say pack cells. I said whole blood. It's fresh. The cells are still alive. It's got 1,500 units of fiber antigen in it. We give whole blood. We have it on all our supervisor vehicles and two of our special ops ambulances. We do hypothermia care because a cold trauma patient is a dead trauma patient. Thank you. There is audience participation here. Wake up. Okay, otherwise we'll have to come out there and work the magic. So a cold pa trauma patient is a dead patient. Even in Texas when it's 102, we tell my medics, boys, you turn off the air conditioner. What do you mean? That means we're going to sweat. I'm going, yep, you're going to sweat. The patient's cold, you're going to sweat. That's how it works. Shut up. Okay? And that's a big change for us. Because think about it. In Texas, we have to have that air conditioning blowing to keep all our meds cold. And blah, 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 I have to be comfortable between calls. But when you have a trauma patient in the back, the air conditioner goes off. Okay? Eye injuries. We have some of the greatest eye surgeons at our level one trauma centers in town. We have one as a civilian at the university, and the other is at uh, Brook Army Medical Center. It's actually a military hospital that takes care of our trauma patients on the other side of town. It's wonderful partnership between the military and our civilian world. Yes, they take civilians, and they don't care what insurance you have. They take care of them as though they are their own soldiers. And our eye surgeons have told us, you can't squish the grape, their eyeball, and expect them to fix it. So cover it up, protect the eyeball, whatever's left, and maybe we can fix it and preserve their sight. So don't squish the grape. Put an eye shield on the top, nothing on it, just the shield. If it drips, let it drip. We also do spinal motion restriction. That's different than putting everyone on a backboard and a collar. Because if you waste time doing that in the wrong patient, that patient will be dead. Okay? So we do spinal motion restriction. I am going to warn you, there's been a trend where people are not using C-collars and clinically clearing patients. You should probably think twice about that in the older patient. If you're over 65 and you've got trauma above your clavicle, your risk of having a cervical spine injury are really, really high. So you should think about doing a collar and spinal motion restriction, which doesn't involve a backboard. It just means putting a collar on and immobilizing their head to the stretcher and taking precautions to prevent that patient from moving their neck and twisting something they shouldn't, okay? So be careful. Old people are crunchy. They break stuff. So be careful, okay? We are pioneering the use of whole blood. So we actually have the Brothers in Arms program where we have O uh, positive donors, they're male, all male, with low titers, low to anti uh, A and AB titers. And we actually give whole blood. It's fresh. It has platelets, it has um, all the clotting factors, it has real red blood cells that work, and it has plasma, and it's 500 Cs of life-saving wonderfulness. We give what the patient's bleeding out. And what we've shown is it's already shown to decrease morbidity and mortality. Um, it's a little expensive. It's 500 bucks a bag, but it's worth it in our budget to save lives. So we actually have a program where uh, it's donated, and after the second day of testing is done to make sure it doesn't have HIV and whatever in it, it goes out on the ambulances with helicopters for 14 days, and at 14 days we swap it out. It goes into the trauma centers, and they burn it up in the trauma bay. And we, don't, we only waste about 8% of the total donor pool, which is amazing of how we manage our resources. So uh, remarkable stuff. This is my, actually my partner, my, med my deputy medical director, CJ. He has special blood because he's an O-positive, low-titer, uh, O-positive guy and can get blood. And that's his unit of blood he just donated. I'm just a lowly A-negative person, so I can't participate in this program right now. 
but he is uh, really jazzed about, and a lot of our firefighters uh, actually are donors in our Brothers in Arms program, uh, and it's a walking blood bank that we have available to us. We have about 800 identified uh, folks, about 380 of them donate regularly every six weeks, and that's what keeps our blood supply going uh, to save lives on our patient. Asthma. So let's talk about asthma just for a few seconds. So asthma is a bronch, we used to say is a bronchospastic disease. That's what I was taught. Well, that's not true. Asthma is all about inflammation. It's a cascade of inflammation with histamine and leukotrienes and vagal nerve intervention that causes the triad of asthma that is bad news. So we have to not only treat it as DMS professionals, but guess what? We have to be the eyes and ears of the health system to prevent it. We have to be change, you know, changers in our, of the environment, changers of education. We have to teach the parents that smoking in front of their kids is probably not a good idea. And if the kid's allergic to the cat, well, let's get the cat out of the house, okay? So those are the things that we need to do. We have a very aggressive protocol. It starts with our first responders uh, using albuterol, and uh, we go forth with, uh, you, we switch to adding the Duoneb or uh, Atrovent just recently to, to use the vagal interaction to decrease mucus secretions, and we use aggressive steroid therapy. We actually have members in our organization that we don't transport all the patients to the hospital with asthma. If they're controlled and we give them a dose of dex, dexamethasone lasts 36 hours, we can navigate them into a clinic system and we don't have to take them to an ER if we can clear them on scene and give them a dose of steroids knowing that, that we have the safety of that steroid kicking in in the next two to six hours that's gonna keep them well. If we have to call in a script for inhaler or albuterol, then we do some of those things as well. And then if things get aggressive, we get aggressive. We start using magnesium. We can't afford racemic epi because that's just a, a very expensive uh, medication and it has to be refrigerated, so we use epi. We use re three vials of regular old epinephrine as our epi neb. And then we also use ketamine. Ketamine is a bronchiolytic, it's a bronchodilator, it's a sympathomimetic. So if you've got bad asthma, we're gonna put you uh, with a little ketamine and we're gonna hopefully break that bronchospasm, get you coughing up those plugs and get you better quicker. So we're driving stuff uh, in the ER uh, that I do in my ER practice all the time into the field. The ketamine tool kit, as you know, you know we have the opioid crisis and uh, issues with narcotics for pain control. We're starting to really aggressively use ketamine in our practice, both for pain and also for takedowns. Um, I get calls every once in a while from grumpy ER physicians. I can't assess your patient because the medics gave him ketamine. I don't know what's going on with them. I'm going, okay, so here's the question. Did any of my paramedics or cops get hurt? And that's what I get, silence, right? I said, okay, great, so no one got hurt, right? Perfect, then you can suck it up and do a CAT scan and figure out what's wrong with the patient. But in the meantime, my people didn't get hurt from the crazy meth head who was whacking out and whacking on uh, the wives or whatever and throwing cops around like court would. I have no problem putting people down with ketamine. I don't care what the trauma surgeons care, say. I don't care what the ER physicians say. As long as my guys and gals can go home safely, that's what matters, and that the patient gets good care. So we need to get control of those patients very quickly, very aggressively, and we don't even flinch about using ketamine. Fortunately, it's tough to get right now, but there you go. Um, IV Tylenol. So this is something I personally discovered uh, myself as a patient I could not believe how effective this was. I could not believe it. So IV Tylenol is, it's Tylenol. It's Tylenol. And it works for pain, the equivalent of tenamorphine or 100 of fentanyl. The only thing is, is that it takes a little time to work. So you can start them out with a dose of fentanyl up the schnoz, right? You can give them fentanyl intranasally, or you can give them a little dose of ketamine to get them going. And then Bazinga, the Tylenol kicks in. The only problem with that is IV Tylenol is a little, little expensive, uh, but I'm gonna tell you as a patient, I was surprised how well this worked. I've had some big surgeries in the last couple months uh, because I have that C thing, you know, cancer, and I was very surprised at how well this worked. Uh, and something to think about bringing into your practice if you can afford it. New technology is coming and you need to embrace it. So the iPhone has changed my practice of EMS medicine. I can now talk to patients and talk to my, uh, my paramedics through FaceTime or through one of the apps. And I can see exactly what's going on in their house, in their home, with their family members. I can do, a, um, do they have decision-making capacity? I can talk to them through the iPhone and know if we need to take them against their will 
or if I need to get hospice involved or what's going on with them. So embrace technology as best you can. The new butterfly, um, you can see right here, the butterfly ultrasound is out. That's 3,000 bucks. It hooks into your iPhone. That's, an, you know, that's a $38,000 ultrasound in your hand. And it has excellent quality and it, it uploads to the cloud. This is gonna help medics make good decisions about when do we pronounce death? Does he have a pneumothorax? Is the airway in? You can put it right there and say, oh, there's the cuff, the endotracheal tube, it's in. You can do IV starts with it. You can look at babies' heartbeats with it. You can do all kinds of wonderful things with ultrasound. So if you, be aware that ultrasound is gonna be your next stethoscope. It is, okay? And it's cheaper and wonderful. We talked a little bit about telemedicine here. So here's a, there's multiple platforms out there, ambulance-based, phone-based, portable-based. I can tell you this is changing my practice as a full-time doc. At, the only problem is at two in the morning when they FaceTime me without calling and my wife's in bed next to me, she flips out, right? She loses her mind when the phone is up and I go, oh, and I run outside real quick. But FaceTime has changed the way I practice medicine because it allows me to interact with a patient in a new way Look at diagnostics uh, real time, get lab tests, and we'll go over a case in just a second. The involvement of physicians in EMS. So you guys know that EMS is a subspecialty of medicine, just like cardiology is a subspecialty of internal medicine, or proctology is a subspecialty of gastro and whatever, right? So I'm a full-time EMS doc. That's what I get paid to do. I, it's all I do. I eat, sleep, drink, and, and do EMS. And I think that's going to be the future. You're going to see more and more full-time physicians either responding in vehicles or more probably, probably through technology and interacting with patients. I write scripts. I keep people at home. We have a no-load rate of about 42% where we don't take patients to the hospital. We use taxi vouchers, telemedicine, and no-load. Um, you're going to see new technology and extended scope. You know what that is? That's a striker saw. My special ops medics can do amputations. Why should I bring a surgeon and nurse Nancy in scrubs and clogs into a very dangerous scene when I can have my experience hazmat tech, uh, supersonic tech rescue, uh, high speed medics do that amputation in the hole, in the grinder, in dangerous places safer? So why don't we train them to do some of those special skills that don't happen very often, but they can do it safer and easier and quicker than trying to get a mercy team or a team from a hospital to do that special procedure. And we practice on cadavers and we practice in the hospital and make sure that they're good to go before we let them loose. You're gonna see ET3, this is new. This is a new pilot project starting this summer uh, and it's gonna be announced in the summertime and probably implemented in spring of 2021. 20, uh, You're gonna get paid as an ambulance provider not to transport a Medicare patient. You got hear, you hear that right? So right now, the only way EMS gets paid is if we transport a patient to the hospital. So if I work a code for a half hour on scene and spend about $2,000 uh, worth of equipment, I have two medic ambulances, a medic officer, engine crew, and a squad, and they're all there for over an hour. I don't get paid buckets. I get nothing, <laughs> nothing and I pronounce the patient dead, and it goes to the coroner's office. I, waste, I spend all that money, all those resources, and I don't get paid a dime. Medicare has recognized finally that's probably not a good idea. So what we're doing is now is ET3. We're gonna have, they're gonna pay for telephone dispatch triage, so we can triage out uh, patients that don't need EMS that can go to another facility or a clinic, like they're doing in Houston now with the Ethan Project. We're gonna have Telemedicine or uh, practitioners on the ambulance is gonna be able to treat and street patients right from the home. Uh, it's probably telemedicine is probably the most uh, easiest way to do that, but that involves having telemedicine, physicians or um, mid-level providers, the ability to send prescriptions, a chart, be able to record the video and do billing. And in addition, the ambulance company will be able to pay, uh, get paid for as though they transported the patient. So the practitioner doing telemedicine gets paid and the ambulance company gets paid to leave the patient on scene. So everybody's happy. You're gonna get paid to take patients to places other than the emergency room by Medicare. That means you may be taking them to a dialysis center or to an alternative care center, urgent care or a doctor's office instead of an ER. And you're gonna get paid the mileage and the base rate and oxygen or whatever you get 
uh, normally from Medicare instead of taking them to an ER. And why? Because you're going to save a bunch of money for Medicare. That's why. That's why this is coming. And their patients are going to get better care, and it's going to be lower risk. Anybody who's been in the hospital knows you're at high risk for bad things happening to you. Infection, mistakes, medical errors, and if we can keep the people out of the hospital, we can prevent that from happening. This is coming. This is coming. So beware and be ready. Extended care units. So I talked to you about physician involvement. That's me, dorky, dorky EMS doctor. As in DC, my, my guys call me, oh, you're just one of them ambulance driver doctors, aren't you? Oh, that's fighting words, huh? Yeah, and you're just a nurse, a doctor helper nurse. That's right, right? Uh, so all those are fighting words, and we can't use that anymore. We are all now part of a big healthcare team. So that includes physicians, nurses, EMS personnel, public health, layperson, community health workers, the neighbor next door is part of the healthcare team. We all have to be inclusive. And what we have to do is leverage those resources to provide community care, preventive care, and acute care, all without transporting a patient to a hospital. So for example, my Mijos, my, that's, you know, it's Mobile Integrated Healthcare Officer, uh, hop, officer. Uh, it's not spelled the same as it is in Spanish, right? It's not M-I-J-O-S. But our, my Mijos are uh, an extended scope of practice medic. They prevent 911 calls. That's what they do, full time. Their goal is to go out and prevent 911 calls, take care of our high risk patients, navigate pain in the rear patients to the proper venues, and take care of hospice patients and keep them at home so they don't go to the hospital. They even dress differently than my firefighters because they are different. They are totally different mission than my normal paramedics who are to save lives and take people to the hospital. Their goal is to save lives, make people better, and don't take them to the hospital. It's exactly the opposite. So you'll notice that that involves a lot of physician involvement. They are only allowed to call me, only me. Not the on-call guys, only me, because I know my patients. I have a, I have a, a group of 200-something patients that we manage, both hospice patients, home health, and high-volume utilizers, and I know my patients. So they only call me. We have Dr. Cooley here is working with our special ops group. So we have spec ops docs as well that help do the extended scope. Here they're, they're practicing ultrasound uh, on a, actually that's one of our other medics. He's getting his uh, heart checked right there. So we're, we're practicing our high, um, high consequence skills and learning new things and different ways of taking care of patients because we may not be able to go to a hospital in some of the places that we are at. If we're four counties away doing an ATF warrant and one of our officers gets shot, we're not going to the hospital down the street. We're going to have to be giving blood, opening the chest, intubating, taking care of the patient until the helicopter can get there and take them. So they have to have extended scope, ex the ability to take care of patients properly, and move along. You have to, the next big bucket, I'm going to move on. First of all, do you have any questions about what's coming down the pike? This is audience participation time. There's a whole bunch of stuff that's coming. Get ready. That may mean you have to go to school. That may mean you have to read. That may mean you have to come to courses like this. That may mean you have to travel to see something special. Right? We're having our whole blood summit in San Antonio on Wednesday, for example. You may have to put some effort into your education so that you can be part of this wave of change, which means you're going to have to work a little bit. And that's okay, because that's what we do as a profession. Okay? We're going to work hard. Next big bucket. Be a navigator of change for your community. So what you have to do is engage your community. That means you don't sit on your butt in the station waiting for a call. You go out and see patients. So if you had a lift assist on the shift before, you need to go see that patient today to make sure she's okay. You need to be engaged with your patients and don't wait for the 911 call. You need to go to them. If they're high risk and they're going to be a pain in your butt, you need to go see them more often, not less often, and figure out what's wrong. You can do things. You can find out what they need. Do they need a commode because they can't get to the bathroom in time and that's why they're falling? Well, you go get one. You have resources in the community where you can get those resources for cheap or for, for nothing or donated. You get them a bedside commode so they can get out of bed, do their tinkle, and go back to bed without falling. 
you reach out and find what they need and you fix it before they hurt themselves. That involves you getting your butt in their house and not sitting at the station. You need to do simple things. Install smoke detectors, CO2 detectors. You need to do med reconciliation. Hey, why don't we look over your med list? Where's your discharge paperwork from Blanchard Valley? Let's take a look at that. And then you look at what the pill bottle says and what the doctor says the patient she should be on. Well, in the hospital, they raise their Lasix to 20 milligrams twice a day. The bottle says once a day. Well, it's no wonder why they're going to heart failure. They're not taking the Lasix they're supposed to because the nurse that comes every week fills it from what's on the bottle, not what's on the instructions. So you need to find out what's going on with their meds. You need to do fall risk assessment. If they've got ladders or throw rugs or they've got junk everywhere, you got to figure out, hey, you know what? I know someone that can, you don't use this couch. Why don't we get this couch out of here? We'll put it in the garage or we'll give it to your Aunt Susie or whatever. Let's get this out of the way so we have, you have more room to walk and you can get around your, your lazy board easily. Uh, and we'll just put two little chairs for visitors up in the corner and you can, they'll fold up and when they come over, you can unfold them, they can sit with you. But in the meantime, you have the whole living room to travel with instead of bumbling around between all this furniture that they don't need anymore. It's simple, stupid stuff that really makes a difference in these patients' lives. And all you have to do is have the guts to, make, to say something and to be in their home and navigate that change. Solve problems that lead to injuries or decompensation. If they can't see because they're cataracts, help them get to the, opt the ophthalmologist to get their cataracts fixed. Hello, it's covered by Medicare. Help navigate them to their doctors. If they don't have a, a doctor, we can find one for you. If they don't have insurance, we have people to help you with that. So what we do is we try and find the problems and fix them and be proactive. And that includes our on-duty engine crews. So engine crew ladder 12 goes to the lift assist for the second time tonight. I'm going to tell you, they, what they did something that just was totally out of the box. Firefighters are fixers. They said, ma'am, we keep coming over here because you keep falling out of bed because you're trying to go to the bathroom and transfer your wheelchair. Your bed's up here, your wheelchair's down here. What if we just, just, I'll go get a K-12 and we'll just cut off the legs of your bed so they're even. No one else thought of that. Guess what? They don't go over there anymore for falls twice a night because she just uses her slide board and slides down the board into her wheelchair, goes to her bathroom, and bazinga, she doesn't fall. And when she goes back to bed, she just basically leans out of her wheelchair and flops back into bed. All it took was one smart guy with a K-12 saw to fix that problem. Think out of the box. So we have a dedicated unit in our organization. They're full-time. I have seven FTEs. It's going up to 11 FTEs this summer. Uh, that does mobile integrated healthcare. You don't have to have this funded. You don't need a special unit with special uniforms, with special names. You can do it with your duty crews. You just have to have someone who's got the guts enough to say, hey, you know what, why don't you go see that lady that we saw last night left and, and see if she's okay. Or if you hear, and you know, some of you work in very small towns, you know when Mrs. McGillicuddy came home from her hip fracture, you know, because you took her in a week and a half ago. She went to the hospital, got her hip done. She went to the nursing home. You probably went there a couple times. And then she's now coming home. Well, why don't you go see her? What's going on? Did you get all your meds? Do you have a walker? When are you going to physical therapy? Is your, who's bringing you food? Is your neighbor looking out for you? Those are the things you can do with some very simple questions to help prevent her from going back in the hospital if or after a fall or a blood clot or God knows whatever else that can happen to her in that environment. Go see patients. It's okay. We do a lot of cool stuff in our organization. So we do hospice. We contract with hospice. Hospice actually pays us to take care of patients with them. So if they, um, all our hospice patients that we contract with are in our CAD. So if it pops up and they're in our CAD, we not only send the engine and the medic, we send a mijo. And the mijo goes and goes on scene. He has already seen the patient usually or knows about the patient from our, our grand rounds. So they know about the patient, and we can work with the family to figure out what the problem is today and how to solve it. Do they need meds? Do they need more morphine? Do they need to be positioned? Is there a new fracture? Is there a new problem? 
Is there a language problem? Is there a problem with a family? Like the new sister from New York just come in and says, oh my God, you look terrible. Well, yeah, because she's dying. Hello. We're in hospice. This is what we do. We make people comfortable. She's in the process of dying, and we explain that to the family. Engine crew, you're in service. Medic crew, you're in service. Miho, you stay there until the hospice nurse gets there, and they pay us for that. They pay us very well for that. So you can get contracts with, with agencies, home health, hospice, et cetera. We do CHF management. We make sure on the day two after they go home, uh, we have certain contracts with hospitals. We've got one cooking right now. Where we make sure that we do med reconciliation, fall risk assessment, smoke detectors. We make sure they have their meds. Make sure they have the oxygen they need. We make sure they, they're eating it. Well, what would you have for breakfast today? Two tacos. Yeah, was it tacos or tacos, right? And uh, what did you have in it? Oh, you know, that stuff. And I go, oh, chorizo and egg tacos. Mm -hmm. You know how much salt's in that, buddy? Yeah, nice, nice plan. So here we are getting you all uh, dried out, get all that potassium and sodium all squared around, and you're eating all this stuff to make you worse. Great idea. Let's, how about we figure out how to do an egg white omelet with vegetables, and we'll put a little salsa on the top and make you happy. And if you want a, you want a tortilla, we'll give you a, a tortilla, not a tortilla, right? So that's what we do. Uh, COPD and asthma, we had a great project where we were working with our asthma clinic at one of the universities where we actually, they didn't, the families were taught not to call 911. They were told to call the Mijo. We would get over there, we'd do treatments, give them steroids, work on the magic, uh, make sure they had all their, their uh, prescription meds, taught the family, we taught Tia Mandi and Tio Joe how to take care of their, their uh, nephew or niece so that when mom was at work, uh, working a double shift at Jack in the Box, they knew how to do the asthma care plan. And that way we kept the kid healthier, kept them out of the ER, when we kept them um, off the hospital, and we kept them in clinics instead of in the ERs. And that was a very effective program. We're still doing that today. Uh, we're responding to narcotic uh, calls, so both in real time and after the fact. So if we get uh, someone who we wake up with Narcan, we have one of the Mijos go, and we have a special unit. It's uh, overtime shift right now funded through a grant. And we actually do interactions with the family and the uh, caregivers, the other junkies in the room or whoever, and we give everybody uh, Narcan education. Look, if he does this stuff again, here's Narcan, peel, place, push. And you can wake him up and you call us and we'll come over and help. And we give him Narcan. And hey, you wanna get clean? I got some people that we can bring over tomorrow. How about we, tomorrow at 10 o'clock? We'll come over with um, Raphael. He's from our uh, Cicada program. He's a, he's a former drug addict just like you. And you know what? He's got some uh, words of wisdom, and maybe we can get you into a program. And we get peer counselors hooked up with them. And I know in Columbus we're doing some great work with that here. But we do that. Uh, but it doesn't have to be the special program that's specially funded with the special uniforms, with the special vehicles. You can do it with duty crews, supervisors, and folks, uh, volunteers even. All right, so in the new uh, age, we're gonna have to have new skills. So um, we have people on vents at home. We have people with trachs at home. We have people with dialysis at home, and you need to get ready to do that. You need to be able to use data from medical records, which means you need to learn how to speak doctor. So you need to understand how a chart works. You need to understand where to find the information you need, like a med list or a problem list, right? You need to know about labs a little bit, about how to find them in the chart. And now uh, we're opening up our medical records more and more and more. I can open up my phone and look at my labs, for, and I can look at the office visit, or what the doctor actually wrote about me on my last visit. And you can leverage that information on scene. It's helpful and can help you to make good decisions and better decisions. You can do med reconciliation. We already talked about that. Make sure they're taking the right meds at the right time, the right way. You can do to work on the social determinants of healthcare. Do they need insurance? Do they need durable medical equipment? Do they need oxygen? Do they need food? Can you have Meals on Wheels come over twice a week? At least you know someone's knocking on the door and they're gonna get a hot lunch and a frozen food for the evening meal, and you know it's gonna be low salt, it's gonna be um, probably di more diabetic friendly than the crap they're gonna eat that they buy from the carry out down the street, okay? So those are things you can do. Work on the social determinants of healthcare and navigate them to resources in your community, which means you need to understand what resources are in the community. You need to know as a medic or an EMT, well, where, do, where can I send someone for drug rehab? Where can I send somebody from the area office of aging? Where can I send somebody to get Meals on Wheel? What's that phone number? How can I call Activate United Way to get all kinds of services in the home? 
what home health company is in the area that works with us really well. That means you need to know those things so that you can send them to those types of resources or bring those resources to their home. You would be amazed about what's out there and who can help you. My medics can go to Project Mend, pick up a wheelchair, a commode, and a walker, and within an hour have, it, have that delivered to a patient's bedside because we have that one call access to that resource. I can have a hospice worker on scene within an hour with me at the bedside. I can sign an order for hospice activation, do an HMP, have the person's DNR signed, uh, and have a neighbor sign as the witness. Bazinga, they're in hospice with a DNR within an hour. You can do that if you know the resources that you can leverage to take care of that. Safety falls and fire. We, those are all the basics of safety healthcare. You can do that every time you're in a, in a house. Every time you go on a call, look for those things. Fall risk, do they, have a, do they have a smoke detector? Do they have a carbon monoxide detector if they have gas heat? Those, you should do that for every call. I don't care what it is. You got plenty of people on scene usually sitting with their twiddle in their thumbs that are not doing patient care. They can take a look around the house real quick to make sure they have, the patient has what they need. And you can come back on another day and make sure that that gets fixed. You can integrate care with others. You know, you can call the patient's primary care physician. Did you know that? Did you know that? Hi, this is Dave. Uh, so my guys, when they, when they call a doctor's office, they say, hey, this is um, Joe with um, Dr. Miramontes' office, Office of the Medical Director of San Antonio Fire. They say, Do with Dr. Miramontes, that gets them through the receptionist. And they know that they're talking to a physician-led team. And they go to appointments with patients. They take patients in a cab to their doctor's appointments, and they are the truth serum. They'll say, oh, what are you eating this week? Oh, I only had two tacos for breakfast. And they'll go, oh, yeah, whatever. You had a full plate of enchiladas for breakfast, and for lunch we had three sub sandwiches. You're full of bologna. Tell the doctor what you're really eating, and that's why your sugar's off the chart. So we're the truth serum sometimes at that interaction, and we tell the patient what's going on at home. We also can leverage the physician to order home health, social services, durable medical equipment, because we know what those needs are. A doctor with his brisk and starched white coat and his tie on has no idea what's going on in that person's house, right? But my mijos and my firemen do because they're there. So they can leverage that information. You can call their doctors. It's okay. When they sign for their run form and they sign that HIPAA release, Bazinga, you're in. You can talk to their doctors. It's okay. It's coordination of care. You can do close follow-up with um, the hospitals. And um, with close follow-up, do they really need to go to the hospital? We're going to do a case in just a second. We're going to talk about that. And advanced care. We'll leverage your advanced care options, whether it be hospice or vents or dialysis or TPN. You would be amazed at what we're sending home when before they used to have to stay in the hospital or go to a nursing home or an LTAC. Well, now they're doing all that stuff at home, which means you better know about that before they call 911. So if you sniff out in your community that Mrs. Schnickenbacher is going home on home dialysis or you have a relationship with folks in your community, well, you should probably go see her before she calls 911 when her dialysis shunt comes undone and she's bleeding all over the place. You should probably know that she's a dialysis patient and that could happen and what to do if that happens. And you can talk to the dialysis nurse, well, what do I do? How do I manage this? Who do I call? And you can have that action plan all ready to go before that ever happens. All right, let's do a case. Since you're falling asleep out there, I see some people nodding off. Let's do a case. And this actually, um, here, let's start back. This actually happened on my drive here. This is an actual case yesterday. On my drive down here from Toledo, uh, I was up visiting my grandkids, and one of my mijos called me and said, hey, Doc, I got um, Mr. Blankety Blank. I go, oh, yeah, we haven't heard from him in a while. He goes, yeah, yeah. So 64-year-old widower, family came to check on him. Um, he has lots of dirty dishes in the sink, so uh, he's been eating pretty well, as you might imagine. Uh, mail and newspaper on the front porch, which is really unusual because he reads the paper every day because he's a sports whacker, right? And we know this because we know this guy because he's, he's one of our high-volume utilizers. He used to call 911 every day. And he's alert and oriented times three GCSF 15. What does that really mean? <laughs> Nothing. All that means is he knows his name, he knows he's at home, and uh, Trump's the president, and he's alert. He can do everything you ask him to. But 
does he really understand what's going on? Is he able to make an informed decision about his health care? Well, I don't know yet. Let's figure it out together. Here's his vital signs. Doesn't look too bad. Is there any red flags there? Any red flags in the vital signs? Anybody? Come on. What? End title. Yeah, what's up with that? Yeah, danger, Will Robinson. There's something going on, maybe, right? And his respiratory rate's up, right? A normal respiratory rate in a human is not 16, okay? It's like 10, or it's 8, depends on how excited I am, right? So, yeah, what's up? Oh, great, great. And you know what the family said? There's something wrong with him. He don't look right. Oh, let's do a 12 lead. It's right there. Anything exciting there? I mean, he doesn't look terrible. He's not having a STEMI or anything, but what do you notice right here? Oh, yeah. So he says, I just don't want to go to the hospital because they starve me there. I, 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 I don't feel good, but I just don't want to go to the hospital. That's what he says. He keeps repeating that. All right, so my miho says, hmm, something's not right here. He does an ISTAT. So we have that technology on some of our units. Our MSOU and our, um, our mijos have an ISTAT machine. What's wrong with here? Oh, what else? Yeah, his kidney function, his dialysis patient. He hadn't had dialysis in three visits. Oh, so things are changing here. And you know what? See that glucose right here? He's never had a glucose below 200, ever. So he's actually sick. If I see a glucose of 100 in him, I'm worried. Because that means he's not eating and he's sick. Right? So that changes the thing. So what other things do you need to do? Or what kind of collaboration do you need to do to make this patient? Does this patient need to go to the hospital? Oh, I can't hear you. He needs dialysis, right? Does he need to go to a hospital for that? Not necessarily. So we check him out. We do all the magic. We call his, his dialysis center. Oh, yeah, he's called off three times. I do have a chair at 10 o'clock. That's uh, 45 minutes from now. Can you get him here? We can get him in. And that's what we did. We got him over to dialysis. He got his dialysis, he got a double run, he came back the next day for a double run, and the next day for a double run, and we tuned him up and got him go going, and he didn't go to the hospital. Because we know him. We know all about him, we know his doctors, we know his dialysis clinic. Um, Miss Patrice is his dialysis nurse at uh, Frenzius Dialysis on Oak Street, and let me tell you, she knows him better than anybody else, because she deals with him every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. She knows all the dirty secrets about his uh, girlfriends and his family and who's who and what's up. That girl knows everything about that patient. So when my mijos need to know what's going on with him, that's who they go to. They know what meds he's on. They have a printout that's five zillion pages long about all his medical history. They know when his prescriptions were filled because he's in a Medicare cap capted, uh, capitated plan. And he sees the doctor twice a week in the dialysis clinic. So this guy, we actually didn't take to the hospital. We navigated him. That's the kind of stuff you'll be able to do if you have those connections, that data, and that ability to make those decisions, and a physician who will back you up. We take him against his will. We, inv we invoke implied consent in the state of Texas. Those are not physiologic values. And so his end title was 22. His labs are all screwed up. He's not con he does not have medical decision-making capacity. Even in Texas... Where your home is your castle, we'd kidnap him. Yep, implied consent. We do it all the time. It, it doesn't make patients happy sometimes, but we have to make sure the patient's safe first. So we do that. All right. So thank goodness you guys were awake and engaged, and I didn't have to, like, do, okay, I guess I've got to call on people because you guys were engaged. So that's perfect. Usually I have to drag it out of you folks because you're half asleep in a coma. Okay, so what else can you do? Let's talk about some collaboration, okay? So this is our South Texas Crisis Collaborative. We had a problem with mental health in our community. All the psych patients were going to the 
ER. And what does that do? Clogs up your ER. And what do they do? They camp out in the ER for days. And then you don't have a bed for that sepsis and the trauma patient, right? So what we said, enough is enough. Why are the cops bringing patients to the emergency room? Simple question. They didn't have any other option. So what we did is we made the easy button. And we got together, we used, leveraged our MedCom process, which is our 24-hour dispatch center. Uh, they use a bunch of trauma stuff. They do helicopter flight following. They do all kinds of cool stuff. They do disaster management. And they already have the CAD, so they know where the cops are going and where EMS is going anyway. So why don't we use them to help coordinate care? And that's exactly what we did. So what we did is, first of all, we got all our psychiatric hospitals together and we said, hey, look, we're going to start bringing you patients right from the field. Uh, the one call, the cops hall, that's all. And they go, you can't do that. And you know what I said? Watch me. So you want to play or not? And I told them, you know, when a police officer or EMS brings a patient onto your campus, that EMTALA is activated? And they said, what's EMTALA? They got a lesson in EMTALA from the state. And they found out that they have to accept our patients regardless of their ability to pay. Do you want to be part of the system? Oh, yes, we do want to be part of the system because we don't want to get dumped on. So we create a system where we know where all our beds are, who has beds, who doesn't, and MedCom manages it, and we navigate patients to those facilities in round-robin fashion so they don't get three at once. We keep the cops in their district, so they only have to go within their response district. So cop friends get to see crazy patient, do emergency detention, take patient to hospital, bing, they're in service and they're in their district. They don't have to drive across town. We made the easy button for our cop friends so that they don't go to an emergency room. And what we found out is that our cop friends know sick, not sick. They know that. So we don't have to have an EMS or a fire truck come out and check every patient. We'll just allow that our cop friends are smart enough to know when they need help. And that's what we did. So what happened was, is that this, this is a great slide. The amount of patients that EMS took uh, law enforcement navigation to a hospital was 9%. Not the 57% where the cops did it all by themselves. And these were patients that the cops did uh, at the hospitals themselves after the patient already got there. So what we did is we decreased the navigation of patients to emergency rooms dramatically. And we filled up all the psych centers. And they were happy because... 57% of our psych patients are, in fact, funded. So we kept all the psych hospitals full with funded patient. Right? That's good. But it takes a system. It takes the balls to go out and do that, to engage your, your stakeholders and get everyone work together. Let's think about who we had to get together to do that. Psychiatric hospitals, hospital CEOs, people that write checks, cops, their cop supervisors, the law enforcement navigation process through STRAC. We had to get EMS involved, the fire trucks, the first responders. We had to get the hospital ERs involved. We even have a program now that if you're medically cleared in the hospital, one call, that's all, we haul, and we get you out of the ER into a psych center like that, 22 minutes flat. You're accepted, auto-accepted, in a bed, ready to go, call the ambulance, they'll take you there. So we actually leverage the system to make it more efficient. An empty bed is a bed that's not making money. So the psychiatric facilities loved it. Other things you can do in your community. Make force multipliers. So we have to do CPR and AED training. We talked about that. Stop the bleed. Why don't we have them stop bleeding before we ever even get our boots on to go out the door? And then that's not a dead trauma patient. That's a patient with a bleeding wound that has their wound taken care of. That makes sense. And then you don't have to give them whole blood and take them to the OR because they're not dead. You need to do CPR training. And it doesn't have to be elegant. It can be a medical student. It can be an eighth grader teaching their other eighth graders. They have that CPR Anywhere kit with a blow-up doll and a DVD. It doesn't have to be the American Heart Association standard using the captograph and the supersonic $5 million mannequin that tells you you're doing CPR correctly. You don't have to do that. It can be hands-only CPR at the back of the mosque, at the end of service, on a Wednesday night at Bible study, or at a soccer game after they're done. 
It can be that simple. So get out there and do it because it's going to save lives more than that fancy schmancy paramedic ambulance. That uh, CPR on scene is the most important step in the CPR triad. Brothers in arms, we had to do our, um, that's our blood donation program that we had to start. In order to do our whole blood program, we had to engage our community. We had to get those young, healthy men that were O-positive, low titer in order to donate. So we had to entice them. Here's a gift card for Bill Miller's or for Kohl's or whatever. And we got our community involved and we got people coming. And when they, we also notify them when their blood's used. So that's helpful. And it helps reinforce that process of them donating. All right, the last bucket. And that's promote wellness. So wellness is not just you. It's also your community. So say no to drugs, say no to alcohol, say yes to tacos. Everything's about a taco in San Antonio, right? We have, so we don't have breakfast burritos. We have breakfast tacos. And they have things like brisket, barbecue brisket and chorizo and uh, carne asada. You know you got good tacos. And when you walk in the room and the bag's greasy, right? If the bag ain't greasy, you might as well not even set them down on the table because that's not good, right? But uh, all kidding aside, we need to make sure that we're good. You have to have a safe, inclusive, and healthy workforce. We had a tragedy two years yesterday. We lost Scott Dean. That's him. I pronounced him dead at the fire scene. I took care of his body and uh, escorted him to the morgue. I was there for his autopsy. I had to speak with his family and tell him why they died. We had to own that death. We screwed up as an organization. Now, did he play a part in his own death? Yes. But it's our fault as command leaders because we didn't train him properly. He was freelancing. We had poor command and control. He was in a place he shouldn't have been in a fire. It was a wind-driven fire, an arson fire. He should never have been in there. He died on our watch. We cannot dishonor his death without doing something about the mistakes we made. And we owned our mistakes. We are bold enough to say we screwed up and we're going to fix it. It hurt. Every one of our command staff were devastated. We, someone said PTSD. We don't use that term in our organization. It's post-traumatic stress injury. It's an injury that can be healed if you do it right. So we don't use that D word. It is an injury, and we were all injured by this event. But because we rallied our resources, both mental health, physical, training, we dove into training. We created the Scott Dean Memorial Training Facility where they practice May Day training every single day. Someone's in the facility doing entrapment and May Day training so that this never happens again. But you have to have a chief and a leadership that's willing to say, we screwed up, but we're going to do something about it. We're going to put funds forth. We're going to take funds from here and time from here, and we're going to do something about it and make things better. You have to have leaders in your organization that are willing to do that. And it has to focus on wellness. We had people off for months, and it's okay. And they came back. One of the, the command officers that was at the scene was tore up by this. But you know what? He's back. And he actually put his energy into making the Scott Dean Memorial Training Center and leads the effort in training every single one of our crew members on Mayday training, entrapment training, communication, and we sent all officers through blue card training because of this. So we took a tragedy and we're making it a positive. And that's what you have to do with everything in your organization, taking a negative and flipping it to be a positive. There is no hero without her. We are pushing the limits in our organization to be inclusive. We want our people to look like the people we serve. We want people that are in our LGBT community. We want women. I have the pleasure of serving under my deputy chief of operations is a woman. She was the chief of EMS for over 22 years. She is my ops chief. She's the number two chief. I have Valerie Frausto here who's our um, assistant chief. We have included women in our organization, and we don't dumb down the requirements. They rise to the occasion, and there is no hero in an organization without her. That is a part of our, our mantra. So we are inclusive of women, Hispanics, uh, also our, our racial mix. We're trying to work on getting more underserved folks in, of our community into our ranks so that we have an inclusive uh, command staff and an inclusive workforce that will connect with our community so that we can do the good work that we do.
So there is no hero without her. There is no hero without our uh, gay, transsexual, and bisexual uh, members. You have to build wellness and hardwire it, which means you've got to spend some damn money. So we have a clinical psychologist full-time. We have a wellness center where we do our NFPA 1582 um, wellness uh, exams every year. On your birthday month, you better get your ass in the clinic or you're going to be off work. You will be disciplined if you do not get your wellness uh, ev ev evaluation. So we, ha we take wellness very seriously, and the cancer initiatives that we're doing have been a very big strain on our organization as far as our funds, our training funds, and our physical plants, because we have very old fire stations that weren't designed for the diesel exhaust. We didn't have separate places to put dirty, stinky, cancer-laden fire gear um, or deconning our ambulances uh, properly. So we had to invest in a lot of infrastructure to make that happen. So you have to have high expectations, focus on prevention and treatment, and rarely discipline patients. When you start seeing things like call-offs and sick time usage, DUIs, that's a huge problem in our organization right now, domestic violence, uh, workplace harassment, mental health or PTSI, you have any of those things, you have to come to the table with resources to make that go away and to mitigate it because it's going to destroy your organization if you don't. So you have to invest in the wellness. So you have to have engaged supervisors that can recognize and not be afraid to say something when they have one of their employees or their crew members that are struggling and get them navigated into our, our different programs. If you navigate before a crime happens, it's FMLA, it's a, uh, ADA, you're protected, your job is protected. If you end up in jail, that's a different story because now we have a problem and you may lose your job. But if you interact before that happens, you're covered. We'll welcome you back one year, two year, whenever your rehab's done, we'll welcome you back into our organization as long as you can still do the job. Keep people engaged in coping. We have a wellness center. We actually have an athletic trainer on staff. So you can go see Betsy if you're injured on the job, off the job, whatever, and we'll help keeping you. We view our firefighters and, and medics as athletes, and we want you to perform at that level. So we provide resources for that to happen. Cancer is a terrible thing. I'm struggling with, uh, I have cricoid uh, chondrosarcoma myself. Today, I don't have a trach. In eight weeks, I will. Uh, we are catching cancers before they're even symptomatic. Last week, we have a young 32-year-old that we caught a thyroid cancer before he ever had symptoms in his screening exam with ultrasound. We catch kidney cancers before they even uh, have blood in their urine. We're being aggressive about finding cancers and treating them early so they keep people alive and so they can enjoy their retirement. We are pushing immunization, immunization, immunization. Who's over 50 in here? Guess what? You get to do stuff. You get to get your shingles vaccine, your pneumonia vaccine, both of them, flu shot every year. You get to have someone look up your butt a little bit, right, to a little colonoscopy to make sure you don't got cancer. Tickle your, uh, your boys to make sure you don't got testicular cancer. If you're a woman, you're getting pat pelvic and you're getting tested for HPV, getting your mammograms. You have to be aggressive about your own health to keep your workforce happy. And you find cancers early so they can go back. I have 32-year-olds with prostate cancer that have radical prostatectomies. I have people with lymphoma and ALL that are back on the job because we found it early, we treated them, they got their stem cell treatment, and they're back on the job working. So you have to be aggressive about your health care. The bundle of bad mojo, and I'm almost done, but this is where you're going to have to take a look at yourself and also look at your community to try and figure it out. In Texas, we have a tortilla-based diet. It's all carbs. That, and we're, it's the triple threat. We're hypertensive. We're Hispanic, and we're fat, right? That's bad. And that leads to diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So the bad mojo of bundle that we're talking about, we have to work on ourselves and our community to help them get better. And this is what we're talking about here. Oh, and you want to be really stupid? Do things like chew tobacco or smoke. Yeah, that's really healthy. I give you great air packs and all this cancer stuff in my fire department. We spend all this money on... A diverting exhaust out of your living spaces, and you go up and light up a Marlboro. Really? Or you're walking around with a spitter cup with chew in your thing so you can get oral cancer. Come on. Get smart. Get healthy so you can enjoy your retirement, and we can get you through your career without getting cancer. But it takes you to work on that as well. 
Take care of yourself. Take care of your patients and your family using the things that we talked about. Take care of your community, your partners and crew. You need to say something. If you've got a crew member that's struggling, you need to step out on the ledge and say something to somebody so they can get help before they're dead. You know who's drinking and who's not. You know who's going home and drinking after a shift because they're depressed. Say something, do something, save a life. Be bold. Get some gonads and help them to get better. And you ha- sometimes you have to say something to someone to help them to get that process. And more importantly, take care of yourself. Make sure that you and your family are engaged in your job and your work and your off time and your spiritual life and your kids and your church. And make sure there's balance because it can't all be about the job. You've got to have that downtime. You have to be able to work out. You have to be, eat healthy. Let me tell you, when I was in D.C., we were, I'll just give you a little story here. When I was in D.C., I was chief mayor of in D.C., and we were doing the renovations. And um, I looked in the plans, and I'm going, why are we putting deep, fat fryers back in the fire stations? And they go, well, they've always had those, because that's how they do fried chicken and french fries for lunch. I said, how about no? And they looked at me like I had a fourth head, right? Well, what do you mean? I said, they're not supposed to be eating that stuff anyway. Why are we facilitating that? And there was like silence in the room, and then they kind of got it. So sometimes you have to go out on the ledge to do things that are bold and different in order to, to drive change in your community, in your workplace, and in yourselves. So this was a whirlwind, three buckets. Practice evidence-based medicine, which means do your damn homework. Read, go to classes, look things up. Second, be a navigator for change in your community. That means you don't sit in your damn fire station or your damn EMS station watching TV and playing video games. You get out your community. You go to soccer games. You go to those faith-based interventions, and you start doing education, and you interact with your community. You get out there. You try and navigate change for your patients and for your community and for your organization to make things better for everybody. And last, wellness. Go to a doctor. Now, that's really a shocking statement, but how many of you really have a personal relationship with a primary care physician that you've been seeing for the last five years who knows about you, your risk factors, and your cancer risk? Yeah, a couple of hands go up. That's it. The rest of you, giddy up. If you don't have insurance, we have clinics for you. They're called federal medical health uh, stations. We can help you with that. But go get a relationship with a physician that's going to take care of you. Cancer screening is full-time business every year for one visit a year at least. And start thinking about losing, you know, losing 10 pounds can decrease your risk of diabetes exponentially. You need help with that? Your doctor can help you. If you need help stopping smoking or getting off nicotine or chew or the damn electronic cigarette stupidness, get some help. We can help you. You have to take care of yourself so you can take care of your family, so you can take care of your community, so you can take care of your organization. It all starts with you and your wellness. Now, I gave you some innovative stuff. You're not going to be able to do all of this at once. You may be able to start with something simple like teaching CPR at Bible school. But do something. Get out in your community, make a difference, and do it one step at a time, and use your resources in your community to make your community better. And that's my message today. So if you're going to be in EMS in the next decade, giddy up. Do your homework, make yourself well, get engaged in your community, and do hard work. And don't sit at the station playing video games because you don't have time for that. We have to make ourselves well. Okay? Thank you. I think I have a few minutes for questions. If you have anyone, and I'll be around uh, this afternoon as well. Uh, shameless plug for uh, Dr. Pepe is going to talk about CPR management. There is a um, great lecture on decision making later on this afternoon. There's all kinds of cool stuff at this, this program, so don't leave. Stay engaged, and if you need something, email me. I'll hook you up. Any questions before we go? Oh, come on. I'm not that good. Come on, right here. Yeah. So we use O positive blood because it's the most, uh, O positive blood is the most prevalent. 
um, and we use O positive low titer blood because you pretty much you can give it to anyone. We, I'm going to tell you this right now. Ready? Listen to my words. Yes, we give O positive blood to women of childbearing age. Yes, we do do that. And the reason why is because if you don't get blood, you're dead. You're not going to have babies with anti-A or B issues that happen later on theoretically. But if you need blood, you get blood. The universal, yeah, we are, but it's so rare. We need that blood for our cancer patients, irradiated blood for all the weird patients that need blood. We can't, we can't waste that. That's a precious resource, and there's not enough O-negative blood around, so we use O-positive, low-titer instead. Any other questions? Great question. And there's a, if you want to learn about blood, my partner is an expert at this. There's all kinds of stuff. The National Blood Summit, strack.blood.org. We'll help you out. Anybody else over here? Okay, it's a great question. So I have seven full-time mijos. I have one on 24-hour shift, and I have three on day work. And then I have overtime mijos from Fire and EMS that staff our homeless uh, shelter at night on the night shift. And we have them doing T-tour on overtime through a grant. So we have two mijos on a, on a vehicle during the day doing outreach. And then um, we actually have force multipliers because when they're not doing overtime, hello, they're still running calls on the engine, and they know the mijo way, right? So once you learn the mijo way, you know, it's kind of like Yoda says that, right? Uh, you understand, and as an engine operator or an engine uh, driver, you can actually leverage the resources that a mijo could more easily because you know the resources in the community, you know who to call, you know how to manage it, and you can make referrals up the chain. So it's a force multiplier. We have the full-time guys, we have the overtime guys, and then the, all the whole cadre of cast of carriers, 80 separate overtime guys that do overtime, they know the mijo way because they've been trained, and they can leverage that process. Good question. But you don't have to have the special program. You can do it with your on-duty crews as long as you have someone to help organize it. Go see patients. Just go see patients. And it'll all fall into place. You don't need a program. You don't need a protocol. You don't need all that crap. You just need to go see patients and do what you do every day, which is fix problems. That's what you do, right? They call, you fix the problem. It's the same thing, only you're not going with red lights and siren, you're showing up with cookies. Okay? You talked very early on about transporting for, uh, arrests to a placing to a full package of care with yep. the cath lab. So here in Central Ohio, you know, that's great right here. Head two hours out, rural. Mm -hmm. You have a critical access hospital two, three yep. minutes away, and then your next level hospital is 30 minutes away. Perfect. So what you do is you take them to the closest place. You make sure that closest place is engaged with the resuscitation center, and we drip and ship, right? So we get them better to the best we can. We cool them down starting there throw them on the helicopter with all the invasive maneuvers, and we get them over, or we have ECMO come to that facility. We put them on ECMO there and take them back. Because if they're on ECMO, we don't care if their heart's beating, right? Because the extracorporeal membrane oxygenation is pushing the blood, oxygenating the blood, CO2 out, sugar in, sugar out. We don't care how well their heart's beating because they're on bypass. So while that stunned myocardium is just barely bumping, ECMO takes care of them until we can get them to the lab. Paul's going to talk about that. Paul Pepe is one of his lectures, I believe. Good questions. Well, that's why it's good to be in Texas. Because in Texas, we have tort reform. Go ahead, sue me. Go for it. Go for it. You know who you're suing? The governor of the state of Texas. Good luck. One. So that's why it's good to be in Texas. Now, uh, did I get sued when I was in Ohio? Yes. Did I win? Yes. So you do have some legal issues, but you have to be bold enough to overcome them. Did I have a problem with uh, my medics taking patients against their will? 
you betcha. I got a bunch of redneck, my castle is my home, I carry my gun everywhere kind of guys, and they were not going to take patients against their will to the hospital if they said they didn't want to go. Because they said, we're kidnapping them. Blah, 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 blah. I said, oh, really? So let's see. Don't you have an obligation under the Adult for Protective Services Act to protect elders and geriatric patients who are at harm? And that's what I got, silence. And they go, oh, yeah, I guess I do have a duty to act, and I have to do that. And oh, and oh, and guess what? You also have to report that, too. So that means you can either go on the computer or go on the phone and call them and take them to a hospital where they're safe. And yes, that's the right thing to do. Yes, do we have some legal concerns sometimes? Yes, we do, but we work them out. By having, we have a really engaged uh, STRAC, STRAC.org. You want stuff? STRAC, S-T-R-A-C dot org. It's these guys right here. Oops, back up. Uh, I lost it. Anyway, STRAC.org. All of our tools are online. We have all kinds of cool stuff on there. Blood stuff, legal stuff, the missed report on how to give report. You name it, we share everything. So yes, do we have legal problems? We work them out, but it's Texas. We have tort reform, we have delegated practice, we have no state scope of practice, and EMT can do anything, as long as I say they can do it, because they practice under my medical license, physically. So it's a delegated practice state. So that makes life a lot easier, because I don't have to ask for permission, I just kind of do stuff, and they go, what are you doing? Right Now, if something goes wrong, the medical board's gonna come after me, not the medic. So um, it, it is a little risky sometimes, but as long as you train them, give them the good tools, and do things right, and you're doing this right for the patient, that's what's important. If you're doing what's right for the patient, you're never going to have a problem in the end because that's what's important, doing what's right for the patient. Do I break rules and laws? You bet I do. You bet I do because that's what's best for the patient. And I'll take the hit for that. And I support my medics 200% when they have to do that if it's for the patient. Good question. What else? Come on, you can beat me up. It's all right. Oh, back there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, most psych patients don't need you, and they don't need a doctor. They need time to get off their mess. Seriously, that what the, most of our psychiatric exacerbations are patients that have social issues, they're dual diagnosis problems, and you think you don't have resources, I th would counter that with you need to find out what your resources are because I bet you do have resources, you just haven't leveraged them. We are very fortunate in San Antonio to have a bunch of psychiatric hospitals and a bunch of psychiatric services and government-funded psychiatric plan, but they weren't integrated. They weren't working together. So we actually have the PEZ, the Psych Emergency Services, 48-hour observation units. We have contract beds in different hospitals. If they get off their meth, they get off their alcohol, they, we start them back on their meds, here's your shot, <laughs> out you go. But it's not just <laughs> out you go, it's, oh, you're going to the TCC on Tuesday at 545, and we're going to check on how your meds are doing and make sure you have refills, and we're going to make sure you have an appointment with your case manager and make sure your insurance is up to date, and da 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 so what we did is we leveraged and made psych care on crack, where we manage those patients. And we even log them in TAV Health. Oh, Johnny Rodriguez, you're in the ER today. Let's see what happens on TAV Health. Oh, you're a high volume utilizer. You're followed by Melissa at CHCS. Let's call her. She has 24 hour access to your case manager. <laughs> Johnny goes to the PEZ. Melissa comes and sees him the next day. We get everything squared around. Why were you fighting with your sister? Why were you using crack? Why are you do not taking your meds? Let's get you back in plane. Oh, you need a respite bed for seven days? We'll put you to the Josephine Center for seven days and get you kind of chilled out, and then you can go home. So everyone says they don't have resources, and I'll flip it back on you, is you probably don't know what resources you have. So that's what you have to go find. And you have to bring people together so they work together and make those resources more efficient. That's what we did in San Antonio. But good question. Anybody else? Come on. Well, hit me at lunch. My email's up there. If you need the slides, I'll send them to you. If you have questions, strack.org, 
or um, our, my COGS are all online. You're welcome to see them. Google San Antonio Fire Department on the protocol app. Um, they're all there. We'll share. We'll, we'll help you. I'm an Ohioan of 21 years that went to D.C. and then went to uh, San Antonio. So I love the Buckeye State. But you need something? Let me know. Thanks for your attention and time. I appreciate the interaction and the questions. All right, we're uh, ready for our lunch break. A couple of notices. Uh, just want to invite everyone to check out the mobile stroke unit that is sitting outside. It, uh